Well, a very warm welcome to St Mark's online service of the word. And we might not be uh, meeting, so to speak, uh, in St Mark's building, but we are still very much St Mark's church. Uh, nothing can change that no matter where we are in, in the country, in the world. Uh, so it's great to be with you for worship this morning. In a moment, Andrew is going to lead us into our worship and he's going to be preaching today. He's going to be helping us to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, a character who we perhaps in the uh, Protestant church sometimes sometimes forget, sometimes neglect uh, due, to, due to historical reasons. So he's going to help us think through that. But before we turn to worship this morning uh, <laughs> or this afternoon or this evening, you know the drill. Uh, I've got a f just a couple of notices for you. And if you are watching this on Sunday morning or even Sunday early afternoon, uh, then these first couple of notices will still apply. And that's that on Sunday afternoon, so Sunday the 15th of, of um, August, uh, we have our craft fair. Now this is going to be lots of different people bringing different crafts to sell, different things that they've made or things that they've gathered. Uh, and that's going to be taking place in St Mark's Church on, on Sunday afternoon, uh, I believe from 1 till 5. Uh, but check the notices, double check the time. Uh, and then the other thing that's happening this Sunday, Sunday the 15th, is that we're hosting our uh, an even song. So the team, the Hitchin team, the team of churches are doing even songs this summer. And this Sunday is our chance to host that. Uh, we're going to be having Stephen from over at St Paul's Walden come to preach, uh, Reverend Stephen Fielding. And it'll be great to have as many folks from St Mark's there as possible to give a, a warm welcome to those from other Anglican churches locally who come to worship with us. So hopefully I'll see you there at 6.30pm Sunday evening. And looking ahead a couple of weeks to the 25th of August, again another two notices to give you there. And the first is, I'm sure by now you've all heard that uh, Christabel Holton has passed away, has gone to be with the Lord, um, which is a great sadness for us as a community, losing someone who I know many of you love dearly, uh, but also we, we, we sit with the hope that we have as Christians. Uh, and we will be remembering her life and holding on to that hope at her funeral on the 25th of August, Wednesday the 25th at 1pm. And later that day, uh, in the evening at 7pm, we're going to be having a meeting as a team of churches in Hitchin to, to meet with the bishop to think about what the future is for the parish. Uh, for a long time, this Hitchin parish is made up of us and St Mary's and St Faith's and Holy Saviour uh, has, has been labouring with, with the PCC that doesn't really serve anybody. And so we're looking at ways to... to to reorganise things uh, in a way that, that is financially more sustainable uh, and practically more joyful for, for those of us who are involved. So that's an open meeting at 7pm at St Mary's. Uh, you're very welcome. In fact, I'd really encourage you to come along to that meeting to, to hear what's going on and, and to have your say as well. So there are other notices. Please take a look at your, your emailed notices from Maggie. But I think that is all from me for now. And now I will hand over to Andrew to lead us on into our worship. Hello, everybody. Lovely to be with you again. We'll begin our service with the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and also with you. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the Lord's name is greatly to be praised. Praise God, for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the victory. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, looking to Jesus in penitence and faith. And saying together, God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners 
we turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our Father forgive us our sins and bring us to the eternal joy of his kingdom where dust and ashes have no dominion. Amen. We sing our first hymn, New Every Morning is the Love. And the collect. Almighty God, who looked upon the lowliness of the Blessed Virgin Mary and chose her to be the mother of your only Son, grant that we who are redeemed by his blood may share with her in the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is read by Rachel. The Old Testament reading is from Samuel 2, verses 1 to 10. In this extract from the first book of the prophet Samuel, Hannah sings her song of praise and gratitude to God for giving her the gift of a child which, when she had thought herself unable to bear one. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. The, bo the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out with bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to shale and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. 
He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat with honour. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversary, shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our next hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. Now here's Becky to read our Gospel. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. In this extract from the first chapter of Luke's Gospel, Mary sings her song of praise and gratitude to God for choosing her to be the bearer of the Saviour. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked with favour on the lowliest of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If times were normal, I might well be in my beloved Brittany today. That's where Deirdre and I met over 50 years ago. And if we were there today, and if the weather were good, not by any means guaranteed in the west of Brittany, then tonight would find us seated cheek by jowl with thousands of others on a crowded beach in Benaudé, waiting expectantly for the sun to set over the horizon and for the fireworks to begin. Launched from a barge floating some 200 metres off the shore so that the wonderful display can be seen not only in the sky above, but also mirrored in the water below. Some of you will be familiar with this special day in the life of largely Roman Catholic countries. It's August the 15th. For the French, it was the most important public holiday in the whole year until the French Revolution made the 14th of July usurp that label. But the 15th of August is still the second most important, always a public holiday, when families get together, eat even more sumptuous food than usual, and, if there is a firework display somewhere in the vicinity, off they go to see it. Why August the 15th? Well, it's the day on which the Assumption of the Virgin Mary is celebrated, the day on which Catholics and some other Christians believe the Mother of Jesus was taken up into heaven, there to reign as its queens. It's a slightly unusual theme for someone to preach on in an Anglican church, you might think. When I was choosing hymns for today, if we leave aside those Christmas carols in which Mary is mentioned, I could only find two relating to Mary in ancient and modern, and we'll sing one of them a bit later. The fact is, we in the Church of England try not to think too much about Mary, unless we belong to the Anglo-Catholic end of the Anglican spectrum. Only those churches are likely to have a very prominent statue of Mary holding a baby Jesus. A non-Christian walking into such a church, or into almost any Roman Catholic church, would wonder who was the object of worship there? Probably a sweet-looking young mum with a blue head covering. Let me start by saying who Mary is not for me. She is not the Queen of Heaven. She is not, as it were, the fourth person of the Godhead. Nor is she the Mother of God, despite all the frequent appeals to her on the lips of the Irish and others, because God can have no mother, being the everlasting, uncreated creator of everything. There was nothing and no one before him. Nor do I believe Mary was herself the product of a virgin birth. That's a myth and an unfortunate one since it suggests that the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, in which I do believe, was not a unique event. And I do not believe that Mary intercedes for us with our Father in heaven. That's Jesus' job and his alone. Most of us Anglicans do not invoke the saints except as wonderful examples of Christian living. But I'm not trying to be negative about Mary, quite the reverse. Although a large number of Anglican churches, especially in this region, are named for Mary, which is probably inherited from our Roman Catholic past, in other respects, we Protestants, if Anglicans can even be called Protestants, have been rather discouraged from focusing on Mary for fear that we will relapse into worshipping her. As a result, we have somewhat diminished her extraordinary role in the salvation of humankind. What would God have done if Mary had said no to him? Well, perhaps it's a meaningless question because God knows what will happen before it happens. Nonetheless, Mary had the free will, which we all have, to say that what God was asking her to do was simply too great a challenge for all sorts of reasons. People say no to God all the time. Part of my role in the Diocese of St Albans is to have initial conversations with men and women who believe God is calling them to be ordained. And it's quite common for them to tell me that they resisted that call for some time, even for decades. For a while, they said no to God. 
Just think of the enormity of Mary's yes. She was, by all accounts, very young. Jewish society liked to marry girls off as soon as it was legal to do so. It shifted the financial burden of a daughter onto a husband. Life expectancy was a bit shorter in first century Judea. Diseases, despite the Jewish obsession with cleanliness, were never far away and were often incurable. A woman's role was to bear children, and it was thought best to start early. It's generally reckoned that Mary was about 14 when she was betrothed to Joseph. With her youth, and our laws would say she was still a child, would have come anxiety at the prospect of childbirth. It carries its own dangers, as it still does. But there were no obstetrics in Mary's time. Death in childbirth was not uncommon, especially for a young woman not yet fully grown. Then there was the fear of what conclusions everyone would jump to, the shame, even worse then than has been the case in relatively modern times, of being visibly pregnant and visibly unmarried. The isolation that, con that that condition would bring with it, as well as the physical danger of being attacked and even killed by outraged citizens. The sacrifice of her good name, which might make any future marriage impossible, and not to mention the disgrace she would bring on her family. Yet Mary accepted the challenge and the risk, not because she was too weak to refuse, but because she was strong enough, faithful enough, obedient enough to say yes to the God she loved. That's why she was his choice to be the conduit by which he came to earth in the form of a human being. Salvation follows from that one word, yes. From her came the saviour of the world and the new covenant with God. Mary sometimes had her doubts about her firstborn son, especially as he began his ministry. She would have preferred him to come back home to Nazareth and resume his carpentry. Mothers never stop being mothers and wanting to protect their children, even when they're grown up. But Mary accepted that that was not to be. She never abandoned Jesus, staying with him until his last breath on the cross. She would become a significant figure in the early church in Jerusalem. If ever any saint was a role model for us all, it was Mary. I have another reason, apart from today's date, for deciding to speak about her. When I was within a few months of retirement, back in 2007, Jane Mainwaring asked me whether I would consider training for lay ministry. It came as something of a shock, and I confess I did not give an answer immediately. It was a big step, challenge. Like many people facing such a decision, I felt ill-equipped and unworthy, just as Mary must have done, faced with a vastly greater challenge God confronted her with. I knew it needed praying about and talking through. But as I pondered the matter, I remembered a sermon I had heard as a teenager, a sermon about Mary's yes. As the weeks went by, I knew that I too would say yes, not because I had no choice, but because I could not imagine turning God down. I don't suppose Mary could either. Mary is not just an example to women. As she was for me, she is an example to every one of us. She is unique in being called to be the physical starting point of the greatest event in human history, the coming into the world of its Saviour. But she is not unique in being called by God to do something, because each one of us is called. We may not recognise that. We may be doing good things without realising that we are unknowingly answering God's call. Having made that statement, I now find myself asking, does that matter? Well, theologians may have a neat answer to that. Like most Christians, though, I find myself unsure of what to think in this case. A good deed done out of love for someone is surely a good deed, whether we are aware that we were being called to do it or not. However, I do think that every Christian should take prayerful time to try and discern what God is calling them to do, even if they are already doing it. We may discover 
or already know that our regular acts of kindness and compassion, which are integral to our daily lives, are indeed what God is calling us to do. And that knowledge will enhance the pleasure we get from continuing. During lockdown, so many people have taken it upon themselves to minister to those in vulnerable positions by keeping them supplied with food or medication, by making regular phone calls or sending encouraging cards, or, and let's not relegate this to the least important, by praying for them. In my view, that is God at work, not just in people of faith, but in all those who acted in such a compassionate way, because that is the spark of God within us, who are created in his image. But Christians should consciously acknowledge God at work in them and ask him and themselves if and how he wants them to continue in their life of service. We often think that God's call is really just for ministers, that he's only interested in the work of the church. And that's simply not so. God is interested, profoundly interested, and wants to be involved in all human activity, which means he wants to be involved in each of our lives. He calls each one of us to act on his behalf, sometimes in the smallest ways, tiny acts of service to others with a tea and biscuit, brief but encouraging moments of interaction such as a friendly smile, a greeting or an inquiry which can brighten the life of someone who is lonely or isolated. If such actions are done out of love for others, our neighbours in the biblical sense of the word, whether we know them or not, we are answering God's call because in such ways we emulate the love of Jesus for each of us. No good loving action is too small to be considered a call from God. Sometimes it's true, the call will not be quite as straightforward, not as momentary. Sometimes it will call for personal sacrifice, particularly of our time and our effort. Regular commitments to visit the sick, the lonely and the housebound, to do their shopping, to contribute regularly to a humanitarian cause, whether financially or through labour, whether to become involved in a community activity which seeks to improve the lives of others, or indeed to participate in some way in the running of the daily and weekly life of our church. All these things are calls from God. I spoke about my call to be a lay minister a little while back. It took some praying and thinking and discussing. And that may well be the case with all sorts of call. It even applies to any job we might consider applying for because all jobs, if God asks us to do them, can be done in a godly way, which may just draw others to ask about our faith in him. It may be that our first reaction about any call is to think, I'd rather not. I'm not suited to it, I don't have the skills, I don't have the time. It's too daunting. We need to get past the initial objections and prayerfully ask whether God really does call us to a particular role or action. One of the wonderful things about God is that he will give us time, that he will accept hesitation or even an initial decision not to answer the call. But he may well keep on calling. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, he writes, It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, as Christians, we have to accept what may seem an extremely challenging message. Our lives are no longer ours to live, but Christ's, and therefore God's to direct. We cannot know God's direction, his call, unless we listen, consider, pray, think, and then answer with a yes or a no. I can assure you, and you may well already know it for yourselves, that there is such joy in saying yes to God. Amen. So thank you, Andrew, for those words about, uh, about me. And we come now to declare our faith in the words of the Creed, a creed which includes the, the phrase born of the Virgin Mary. So right there at this foundational document in, in the Christian faith, Mary features. And, and we do well to remember her, her example of, of faithfulness to God.
So let's declare our faith in the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to our third hymn, Remembering Mary, the hymn called For Mary, Mother of Our Lord after which Edward Stone will lead us in prayers of intercession. Loving Father, we thank you for your generosity to us in so many material ways. We so often take for granted our homes, our cupboards and freezers full of food, and the security that comes from living in a country which is rich and peaceful. But we know that you have a special care and love for the poor and the oppressed, and that you promise to lift them up and give them good things to eat. We pray for the victims of war and hunger in Afghanistan and so many other countries, which we see on our television screens and then forget about afterwards. The climate crisis is frightening, Lord, and we know how much fire, floods and extreme heat are already hurting the most vulnerable people in our fragile world. Give our politicians and the leaders of the world the courage 
and the vision to take decisive and sometimes unpopular decisions to respond to the crisis. Give us hope, Lord, and show us all individually and as a church what we should be doing differently so that we make a difference as well. Finally, we pray for our young people particularly those who've received GCSE and A-level results this week. Thank you for all their hard work through a very difficult year and guide those who are having to change their plans for university and college. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So at this point in our service, we remind you that if you'd like to donate to the work of St. Mark's, donate financially uh, to the work of St. Mark's, you can do that through the St. Mark's website, through Church Suite, for those of you who are on that. Uh, and if you contact one of our wardens, there are other ways to donate to, and they can give you more information about how, how to do that. It's, um, it's wonderful for me coming in as vicar. I've been here for sort of nine months, I think now. Uh, it's gone by in a flash, but it's been amazing to see the generosity of the St Mark's community, whether that's generosity with their finances or their time or, or their prayers or, or their talents. St Mark's is a generous and giving community. And if you want to, to participate in that, if you want to, to donate uh, through money, then you'd be very, very welcome to do so. And thank you for that. Let's just take a moment to pray, to give thanks for, for the provision of this community uh, to keep this community going. So Lord God, we thank you for everything that people of St Mark's do to, to keep this community going, to keep this community of love uh, on the road. We thank you for people's generosity with their money, with their time, with their talents and with their prayers. And as we seek to steward everything well for your kingdom, I ask that you would give us wisdom and open hearts to know what it is that you want us to do as a church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in terms of generosity, we come now to a point in our service where we remember the generosity of Christ, uh, Christ who gave himself for us. And we remember that using the words of 1 Corinthians 11, where St. Paul speaks of Jesus talking to his disciples about the Last Supper. And this is what Paul wrote. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's just take a few moments of silence to reflect on what Christ has done for us. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given us, for all the pains and insults you have borne for us. Since we cannot now receive you phys physically through the bread and cup, we ask you to come spiritually into our hearts, O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Um, we come now to sing our final hymn, a fantastic hymn, one that I love despite my relative ignorance of, of hymns. It's Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. So that brings us almost to the end of our online service of the word this morning or this afternoon or this evening. Thank you very much for joining with us. I hope that you found this a meaningful uh, worship experience, not just something you've you've watched while you've been eating your breakfast, although you might have watched it while eating breakfast and that's fine. Uh, but hopefully you have been able to worship God, to know his love and to be ready to, to go out into your week to love and serve him. I hope to see you, um, hope to see you soon, maybe even this afternoon at the, the church events that are on, uh, but I do hope to see you. And in the meantime, uh, I pray you have a wonderful week. I pray that you know the love of God and of friends and of family. So as we come to a close, let us pray. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, accompany us in this day's journey. Dawn on our darkness, open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may God give to you and to all those you love his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love and pray for now and always. Amen. We go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love and to reflect God's glory. Amen.